All right, well, we're back with another episode of The Musician's Beat, which is WCF Symphony's occasional chats with our orchestra musicians who are, as many of you know, uh, living around the state and in other states. And uh, this is a great opportunity, while we can't get together as often in person, to hear what everybody's up to and get some perspectives on what's been happening in this pandemic world that we live in now. And today's guest is Heather Armstrong, our principal oboe since, I'm not sure, she's going to tell us in a minute, but, uh, but Heather, uh, Heather is uh, living up in Decorah, uh, teaching in that area, and um, uh, has played um, so many memorable concerts with the symphony. It's just been, it's been such a pleasure for me to, um, to work together. So Heather, welcome. Great, thanks. Good to see you, Jason. Yeah, it's great to uh, see you, too. It's like we would have been together playing summer gigs or whatever, and now we're doing this, but at least um, at least there's some opportunity for conversation. Um, and so, you know, along those lines, kind of just tell us a little bit about who you are, what your background is for anybody uh, watching who may not know you. Sure. I, uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so on the East Coast, and I went to school um, for music in New York, um, Houghton College, and then Eastman School of Music. And in 2006 is when I moved to Iowa. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, how did you end up here from Pennsylvania? And it really was the job at Luther College. So I teach oboe uh, there and music theory, um, first and second semester, and music um a music ed class, uh, double read methods for those students who are going into music education. So they learn how to play the oboe and the bassoon. So I've actually been playing with the orchestra for that same amount of time. I think I started that same fall. I moved uh, to, to Decorah and it was um, an ex absolutely wonderful discovery to find this gem of a little orchestra in um, not too far from where I live. It's about an hour and a half drive, um, but it's been a really um, important and special part of my musical life since I moved to Iowa. Well, it's something that folks may not think about is how much driving is, is a part of the life of the Midwest musician, particularly out here in Iowa. And, and you certainly have experienced that. I mean, just, just in your drive from the Decorah area down to Waterloo Cedar Falls, but I'm sure you've also had gigs elsewhere. And um, that can get pretty hairy in the winter. We've had conversations before about that. It sure can. Yep. <laughs> sketchy roads out there when it's windy. Well, so um, so uh, in addition to your teaching and of course um, you know playing uh, with the orchestra and the section, um, certainly uh, you've done a lot of other really interesting work with with different composers and, and a whole a whole array of different artists. Um, tell us about some standout uh, projects that have gone down for you over the last um, you know t five ten years. Sure. Um, I think one of the the most um, long-standing collaborations maybe I've developed since moving here is with my friend and colleague Brooke Joyce who also teaches at Luther College and is a wonderful composer and I've played a number of his pieces over the years and have gotten involved in the Iowa Composers Forum um, where I've played some other Iowa composers music um, including Brooke's music but one of the most special collaborations Brooke and I have had is the concerto he wrote for me to uh, play with the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony. I think that was in 2014 um, in the spring. So that right. was um, a special project uh, that I did with Brooke and with the symphony. That, and uh, um, yeah, oh, go ahead. I think you're right about that that date. And, um, you know, I was hoping you'd talk a little bit about that project because um, not only was sort of the relationship that you developed artistically with Brooke in, in the center of that, but the piece also had this whole other context around it that was so interesting. And I just find that fascinating about um, uh, those kinds of artistic relationships like, like you have with Brooke. And I felt like I was allowed into that, that group as well. That was a wonderful experience. It was. It was. It was really wonderful. And even though I haven't performed it again yet as an orchestral piece, um, Brooke and I have done it in a couple other places, um, him playing the piano, um, and he made a reduction of the orchestra part. So I've had a couple other chances to perform the piece. Um, the International Double Read Society um, has an annual conference, and so we did it there. We've done a couple of the movements at Luther. Um, so it's been great to revisit it over the years and com keep coming back to it as music that I learned brand new, you know, no one had ever played it uh, the first time, and now I feel like having done it three or four times now, um, it feels like a really special piece to me. What an incredible experience to sort of be part of, a, you know, just an idea at the beginning that becomes 
a piece of music and then it, it starts to gain a life of its own as you perform it in different places and for different audiences. That's, that's wonderful and I, th I think that's testament to um, the ability to develop the kind of relationships like obviously that you and, and Brooke have um, you know, up on the faculty there but bringing your music outside of the, the walls or, and lawns of Luther College. Um, uh, maybe we'll get a chance to hear um, some of that music in our archive series over the course of the year. Um, we'll be mixing that in with our live performances so we can talk about digging that one up. I've been doing a lot of digging in the archives, um, of course, because because we can't do normal performances. And so um, to come to you know the part of the interview that everybody seems to be most interested in, kind of what is post-COVID life like for you as an educator, you know, as a performer who plays in large ensembles and also performs for all kinds of audiences, um, talk a little bit about how this has been since it came on and some of the adjustments and, and, and changes in thinking that you've made. Sure. Um, it's been quite a ride the last six months. Um, the, uh, probably the major challenge for me has been my in my teaching. So mm. um, a very abrupt and sudden move to um, teaching remotely in March. Uh, so um, that shift all happened right around our spring break. So we had still about a half a semester left. Mm -hmm. And I spent spring break trying to prepare to teach lessons, music theory, and um, methods online uh, 10 days later um, and then we had about seven or eight weeks left of the semester so I felt like my workload um, increased I don't even know how many times but I was just I felt like I was constantly working um, during that time and of course all the performing kind of um, just disappeared uh, during that time so some of the things I've been looking forward to there are a couple more um, symphony concerts left um, in the season, I was um, scheduled to perform at the International Double Reed Society Conference in Iowa City, mm -hmm. and um, that was canceled, so that was kind of a disappointment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so kind of the lack of, um, the sudden lack of performing combined with the very sudden increase in workload in terms of my teaching was a very, um, kind of a strange combination, I guess. Yeah, and I think a lot of us found ourselves doing these sort of other tasks that we we, we might have done normally, but now there was a gap here, but a need over here and, and really having to, to shift. I'm curious, as, you, as you've come back towards um, like this new school year and what typically is a new symphony season and a new arts season, you know, it almost always runs on that same September through May calendar. Um, what are the things to you that you're most looking forward to right now, at least in terms of the landscape that's in front of you? I know everything changes every other day, but um, yeah. let's just say right now. And, and in addition to that, you know, what are the things that you think have been the biggest challenges or might continue to be the biggest challenges? Yeah, well, they're, they're kind of related. What I'm looking forward to the most is the opportunity to, in some fashion, see my oboe students again yeah. um, in person. Um, and that's Luther's plan for now. Um, in starting in October, um, some sort of hybrid in-person um, combination of lessons. So what I'm hoping for is uh, to be able maybe to see my students in larger spaces. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of research coming out this summer about what wind instruments and singers produce in terms of their aerosol production um, and how that may possibly contribute to the spread of uh, the coronavirus if someone was to have it while, while playing. And so um, we're trying to find as many um, mitigation um, kind of layers, I guess you could say, as, as possible to try to make that um, safe. So that's what I'm looking forward to the most. I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not, or if sure. I end up um, doing most things remotely, but that's that's my, my hope. Um, and the challenges are related to that as well. So how to continue to teach and connect to students and um, provide them with the learning um, opportunities that, that they're looking for and that they need during this time in, in a way that um, serves them the best and tries to keep everyone as safe and healthy as possible. I was really hoping you'd, you'd share uh, some of that insight with us because you know, a lot of times as we talk with performers, it's a little focused on ourselves and, and kind of just what has happened to our, even our sense of identity as we don't really have an audience, you know, to play for in a physical sense. But it's really wonderful to hear you talk about your students, your relationship with them, and also the immense amount of work that educators and institutions are, are doing everywhere to try to do the best thing they can in terms of the safety and also the experience of learning for students. And so I really appreciate that, and I'm sure everybody watching is is equally appreciative 
Yes, and a big, you know, just uh, as someone who's kind of in that world, um, uh, I hope everyone can just be really um, encouraging and supportive of those in education right now. I think unlike, say, the medical profession, um, you know, education, we're just kind of out there on our own trying to do the best we can. We don't have as much guidance or, um, you know, support in terms of getting protective equipment and things. And um, so, yeah, just a, a shout out to educators in all levels um, and for everyone to keep supporting um, people doing that work. Well, and a shout out to you, Heather, and, and you're doing a lot of that work yourself, and, and we're very proud of you for it, and it's wonderful to see that hopefully we'll be, you know, getting some uh, oboe lessons going for you in person soon. Um, in the meantime, we're going to wrap up here, but I just want to thank you once again for joining on The Musician Beat, and hopefully we'll be seeing you as part of our concerts that are going to be going on online throughout the course of the season. We hope to get back to audiences, um, you know, in the spring sometime, but it's going to depend on a lot of different factors, and so for now, um, we're proceeding with our safety protocol for small ensembles to, to you know, perform virtually, and hoping we'll see you on uh, some of those some of those shows this semester. That's another thing I'm looking forward to is is playing again. Yeah, in whatever capacity that is. Well, we'll get there. Working hard to do it, and in the meantime, we love the fact that you shared your thoughts with us. Thanks so much, Heather. Great, you're welcome. It was really good to see you, Jason. Likewise. <laughs>